Do we have visibility? Yes. All right. And the audio is still okay? Yes. All right. Thank you all for this part two, if you will, of, of the uh, system redesign EMS transformation thing. So this is our 2024 update. Um, we're going to have some fun with this. So it, it's not going to be, well, it might be just as doom and gloom as the others, but it's going to be sort of a little bit more fun. Um, so a little bit of a quick review about what's happened in EMS that you guys probably know as well as we do, uh, understand how we continue to evolve, but more importantly, give you specific examples of programs that uh, are happening across the country, arguably a lot of them here in Fort Worth, because I have intimate knowledge of them um, that have been or are in the process of being implemented so that you can copy them. Um, what, what's the term that Rob Lawrence used, um, where you steal things, you rip it, whatever it is, but that's fine. Um, understand value, how to do de de determination of value, and learn how to do it in partnership with other people. And I think we did this last time. I have some new signs from community from um, Indian Hills Community Center. So I thought these were pretty funny. They're, they're recent ones that, that I found. Um, underwear bandit caught admits brief crime spree. <laughs> Pension thieves, please carry ID so we can identify your next of kin. Um, in Texas, this is a big deal. About 40% of our shootings that we respond to are um, perpetrators who have become victims of a shooting, which is because people, care, everybody carries guns here. And it's just, you know, people will learn sooner or later. So if we were to ask the room or the virtual community that we have online here, uh, what would what's one or two words would you use to describe the current state of EMS delivery in this country? Think about that for a second. Uh, the only one, the one that I came up with that seems to be perhaps most descriptive is it's a dumpster fire, right? I mean, anything that could possibly go wrong with system delivery is literally going wrong. So it starts with the workforce challenges. You know, the, the state of Minnesota did a great analysis in 2022, looking at um, paramedics and EMTs whose certifications had expired compared to the new certifications issued Red line, expirations, green line, new certifications. I, I think anybody with any knowledge of graphs would say that's bad and it's probably not sustainable. When you've got more people leaving than coming into the profession, that's a problem. They dove a little deeper and found that compared to other trades, EMT and paramedic wages are lower than some of these like construction laborers and you know why would you want to work in EMS where you can get shot stabbed puke on catch a disease work nights weekends holidays be away from your family essentially have no work life balance versus being a construction worker where you work 9 to 5 or 5 to 9 depending on the shift that you're working and you when you go home you're home and you, you might not have to work in an environment that you can contract a disease bring home and kill your family etc cetera, etc cetera. The American Ambulance Association for the last several years has contracted with a firm to do a turnover study. The most recent study came out the beginning of, or middle of this year. And of the full-time EMTs and paramedics that are leaving, most of them are changing careers. It's not because they're going from Ute Pass to AMR, or AMR to Ute Pass, or you know, somewhere else. They're just leaving the profession. Say, this is not worth it, I'm leaving. And mostly it's overpaying benefits because quite frankly, if you can go work at Amazon for 24 bucks an hour um, and you don't have to worry getting getting a late call or getting run over on the street. Uh, why not? And that's just become you know a pretty big issue. Now, I, I did a quick Indeed search um, recently and found these jobs being advertised on Indeed. Every one of these are for paramedics. Every one of them's in a hospital, and they're paying pretty well. The reason that hospitals are recruiting paramedics is because they are cheap nurses. There's a severe nursing shortage, especially post and during the pandemic. And nurses were getting, in some cases, 100, 120, 160 bucks an hour for a contract nurse to come in and work in the hospital. So hospitals have a different economic model to a large extent, and they've got different needs. And if I'm a CFO at Colorado Springs General, and I can hire a $100 an hour nurse or I can hire a $30 an hour paramedic. And in many states, the paramedic can actually do more from a clinical skills perspective than the nurse can. So in Texas, the hospital association lobbied several years ago and paramedics can work in their full scope in any healthcare setting. So one of our paramedics could go work at the hospital, intubate, push narcotics, do um, IO, IV initiation. And many times nurses can't do that. 
So you get a really well-skilled technician that is a third, if not less, the cost of a nurse. Here's the example. One of our large level one trauma centers advertised their winter schedule. And during the winter, they hire paramedics to work in the ER. In the winter, they hire more paramedics to work in the ER. There are always paramedics in the ER. And this is a you know 180 bed ER. This is a big facility, okay? And this is what they put out on, on their advertisement. And they sent us a copy, it said, thank you very much. $8,000 sign-on bonus to go work in the hospital as a paramedic where it's air conditioned, it's heated, you don't get run over, you don't get a late call, end up going home late, missing the birthday party. Um, yes, we got to do nights, weekends, all that kind of stuff, but $48 an hour. We can't pay that. I mean, the max paramedic here is, you know, when they start making $27 an hour, um, we can't compete with $48 an hour. So it becomes a big issue. And in many cases, we are competing with ourselves. I was, I had the benefit a year and a half ago of being in Franklin County, North Carolina, where I was doing a presentation for the county commission about the fact that their EMS system is really struggling and you need to make some investments. And one of the things I said is that you need to raise the pay rates for the EMTs and paramedics that are working for your county EMS system by at least 20%. While I was giving the presentation on a Tuesday evening, this news alert comes across my, my news subscription. And I looked at it, <laughs> it's into the presentation. I said, by the way, remember I said one of our recommendations is 20% pay increase. It's actually 25% pay increase because, because Wake County, which is the next county over, just increased their pay rates 21%, which means that you need to raise your pay rates 25%. So I'll edit the final report to, to say that. A few months later, Johnson County, the county to the north of, of Wake County, announced a 42% pay increase. Why do you suppose Johnston County had to offer a 42% pay increase to their, because they were all leaving and going to Wake County. We This is not sustainable. We cannot compete with each other, which is why there's been a big move across the country and even some discussions about Congress um, authorizing some federal dollars to encourage emergency services agencies, police, fire, and EMS, to regionally consolidate. 911 centers are a good example. Um, you know, here in our county, we've got 40 some PSAPs in our county of 2 million people. Um, that's ridiculous. We need one, maybe two, one for sure. Um, every one of those 42 PSAPs are understaffed by like 30%. And they're all competing with each other for pay rates. So it's this, this traffic jam on Main Street going from Grapevine PSAP to Arlington PSAP to Fort Worth P It's just crazy. Um, but if we consolidate it all into one PSAP and dispatched you know, 500,000 calls a year instead of some that are dispatching 1,000 calls a year, um, so there's, there's some incentive to do that. These are ads that have occurred um, here locally, but also in some areas across the country that I thought I would never see. 43 years in EMS, never in my life would I think to see fire departments offering sign-on bonuses for paramedics to come work there. Um, it, it's just crazy. I was talking to a fire chief in California a month ago, two months ago, and he told me that normally when, in the past, I should say, not normally in the past, when they have one paramedic firefighter position open, they would get 100 applicants. Because, you know, a paramedic firefighter job is pretty lucrative and people like it and it's a great schedule. And um, when they advertised for their paramedic firefighter position, they got eight, eight applicants. Of those eight, four did not show up for the interview. <laughs> That's saying something. So the staffing crisis is here and it's here to stay. Loved this. So last May, I got an email from a friend of mine. Um, they run a um, the security for a very, 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 very wealthy family here in Fort Worth. And the family travels internationally and they wanted to have a paramedic with them all the time. And they wanted some of ours. 
So she was asking me for a job description, what some of our requirements are and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, Amy, listen, here's the deal. For the reasons that you want our paramedics, the minute they start working for you, they're going to be sucky paramedics because they're not going to be doing any skills. Plus, you're going to take them from us, which kind of pisses me off. But what if we worked out like an innovative process where you pick, you know, three, four or five people who want to do it and you guys interview them and blah, blah, blah but they always remain employed by us and we rotate them monthly. So for a month, they work on an ambulance treating patients, keeping their skills up for a month, they go on vacation and they work for you. And then the next month they're back on the street because that way you're getting good paramedics who are seasoned and experienced and no skill degradation. And we don't lose all those employees. So guess what we're doing? And by the way, they pay us. So we become the lessor, if you will, for employee leasing. Some funny employees called us the pimps, but it's still sort of the same thing. Um, just collaborate. And, and we're working on the same thing with the hospitals. You know, can we do that with the hospitals? Instead of them taking the folks, um, just keep them on our payroll, we lease them back to you and everything's good. This has gotten obviously a lot of national attention. Um, thanks to Rob Lawrence and several folks who are contributing to this process. There's a national media log that we're all contributing to. And it's updated and sent out every Monday. And since January 1st, we've been able to track, I missed a number, 1,323 local and national news stories about EMS. 57% of them talk about the funding crisis, 36% reference the, uh, I'm sorry, reference the staffing crisis, 36% reference the funding crisis. Uh, many of us will tell you that they're linked. The reason we have a staffing crisis is because we have a funding crisis. And if we were funded differently and could afford to pay people what they're worth, we wouldn't have a staffing crisis. Um, but more importantly, 71 systems have closed since January of 21. And as you all know, or may not know, yesterday, day before yesterday, Air Methods, one of the largest air ambulance providers in the country, filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, when I saw this, I got some text messages from people and I said, this is the canary in the coal mine. Right. This is, you know, they're the first ones to take that bold step. They're going to try and restructure. I'm not sure they come out of this. Um, high overhead costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So th this is real. And, and the funding crisis is causing systems to close and services to go bankrupt. GEMT. I would imagine that there are some providers in, in Colorado that participate in a GEMT program. It is a very good I'm sorry. It's a convenient way to do money laundering. Um, I fully support GEMT programs. MedStar participates. We're a public provider. Texas has a GEMT program. Um, and it's designed to use federal dollars, technically some state and federal dollars, but it's never state dollars. It's always federal dollars. Using federal dollars to reimburse public EMS agencies because the Medicaid programs pay less than the cost of service delivery. That's a burden on the taxpayer. Therefore, the federal government reimburses a portion of that, and it becomes a nice check at the end of the year or an add-on payment to the Medicaid payments that come in from the state. They've been in place for about eight years, and there are 30 some states that have some type of a GEMT public supplemental payment program. Currently, there are five states who have applied, submitted a state plan amendment to CMS to have GEMT programs for their public providers, and exactly zero of those state plan amendments have been approved, whereas in the past, it was perfunctory. Send the state plan amendment, we rubber stamp it, send it back, and now you start getting all sorts of federal money to um, cover the cost of the underpayment for um, public ambulance agencies. But there's a problem, and the, and the problem is this. The cost reports that are required under the GEMT program in every state, because the feds require it, revealed some interesting data. Public Consulting Group, which is probably one of the largest agencies doing cost reporting for agencies across the country, and they do 
almost half, if not a little more than half of the cost reports here in Texas, um, released some data. Um, this data has been known because everybody's seen the data. The states see the data. The feds see the data. Um, but the data was pretty revealing. And if you notice, the cost of a fire-based EMS provider versus the cost of a non-fire-based EMS provider is significantly different. And some of us have been saying for a couple of years, why, why is that? Well, now more than just us have been saying that. Last August, the Centers for Medicaid Services sent this memo to the state Medicaid directors, all of them. And it was a two and a half page memo. And the key part of the memo was this, hey, we are concerned about why fire costs are so much higher than non-fire costs. We believe, potentially, that the fire agencies might be including costs in their cost report that are not allowable for the Medicaid GEMT program. The GEMT program is only for covered services. Sending a fire engine to a medical call is not a covered service. If you have approved cost reports that include the cost of anything other than putting the ambulance in front of an address, we have a problem because federal money has been used to reimburse non-allowed expenses. Now, when this memo came out, some of us said, uh oh, Scooby, jig is up. Um, and I, I said in several public meetings and, and amongst the fire chief friends of mine, watch, there's gonna be an audit. And if the feds get a hair across their ass and they start auditing these reports, they're gonna want money back. And for some departments, they were getting GEMT reimbursements at the end of every year between 20 and $30 million for the past seven years. So imagine that you're the mayor of Houston and your average GEMT reimbursement on September 28th of the last seven fiscal years has been between 20 and $28 million. And now the feds say, no, 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 it really should have been about 7 million each year. They do the math, they say, you know, we, we need a $70 million reimbursement because we overpaid you and you fraudulently reported your costs. So you can either choose to pay the 70 million or we'll sue you for the money and you can pay the court costs. Um, or we'll suspend Medicaid payments for your agency until we get caught up, which is what they do when they do Medicare audits, right? And they find that they overpaid. Big deal, <laughs> right? Potentially a huge deal. Well, guess what? July, this past July, the Office of the Inspector General said, guess what? We're going to start audits. And I said, told you, it's coming. Interestingly, two days ago, I had said, or last week, I sent a note to our uh, PCG person. I said, hey, historically, you guys have given us the MedStar cost compared to the other 56 agencies that do this. Are you guys going to be able to do that for us again this year? And this was their response. They said, um, honestly, probably not, because here's why. Last Friday, I received a note from Stephen Wells, the audit coordinator for HHSC. That's our Medicaid program. The federal OIG is going to initiate audits of Texas ASPP providers, Houston, Laredo, and Dallas, all fire-based services were selected first. Here's their data from just last year. So the city of Houston got a $14.8 million reimbursement for GEMT. San Antonio, 13, Dallas, 11. Of course, you know, MedStar got a measly 1.6 technically um, once all was said and done. So uh, this is a big deal and it's no surprise that they're auditing Houston, Dallas, and Laredo. So I asked this representative, I said, well, how come they're not doing San Antonio and Corpus? I said, well, they are, but we don't do their cost reports. <laughs> so the, other, the other cost reporting agency is having to go through the audit for those folks. So it's interesting that the feds picked 
the six, five or six largest reimbursement agencies to be audited. Didn't pick Travis, Austin Travis County, didn't pick MedStar because our costs, I tell you that our responses, we do more calls than Laredo Fire and we do more calls than Corpus Christi Fire. But we're not being audited because the feds said, yeah, you know, 480 bucks to put an ambulance in front of an address, that, that works. Not $2,600 to put an ambulance in front of an address. It's a big deal. Um, signs, kleptomaniacs always take things literally. Come on, that's pretty funny. To the thief who stole my antidepressants, I hope you're happy. <laughs> we talked a little bit about this in the morning session. Response volumes are crazy, so that's part of our challenge and the, and the transformation that we're having to go through. And, and the cost reimbursement really kind of just sucks. We talked about the cost drivers, but I wanted to share this with you a little bit. This was the study I referred to earlier today. And this was the one, 450 responses, most of them fire agencies. Oh, let me back up. Um, note these cost increases. So 10, 12% cost increases in supplies, equipment, personnel, overall cost increases of 8%. Um, and, and that's a big deal. And they're certainly not getting an 8% increase in their, in their reimbursement. So when we ask them, what do you think is going to happen in the future? Everybody seems to think this is here to stay. So these cost increases, you know, ambulances that we bought three years ago, four years ago for $240,000 are now 320000 And you can't get them on buy board anymore because the manufacturers aren't bidding for ambulance sales anymore. They're telling you, here, this is the retail price. Pay it or not. Because we got five other people waiting in line. You need to decide by noon if you're going to buy this truck or not. And it's just ludicrous. Um, supply chain. So this is part of the dumpster fire, obviously huge supply chain issues, um, medication shortages, vehicle shortages, just becoming a major issue. Um, I don't know if how many of you subscribe to this, but we get this once a week from the FDA. These are currently all the drugs that are in shortage. And for those of you that have been keeping score, these drugs have been in shortage since like the turn of the century. And the National Association of EMS Physicians, ASEP, the American Hospital Association, NAEMT, AAA, we, we've been trying to ask and ask and ask and ask, why are these chronically in shortage? And it wasn't until a year and a half, two years ago, that we finally got a straight answer from the manufacturers. And what the <coughs> manufacturer finally told us, God's honest truth, their words, not mine, was that these drugs all represent drugs that are no longer under patent protection, and they are more expensive to produce than they are to sell. Um, we can't make money on these drugs. So we are not going to do them anymore. Wow, at least that's an honest answer. Um, Bruce Evans um, shared, the uh, immediate past president for NAEMT shared something he learned from the National Academies recently. There is not one manufacturer of epinephrine in this country. Every epinephrine, epinephrine manufacturing plant is in China. Every one of them. So if we go to war over Israel and, and Palestine and the Gaza Strip and China wants to cripple us and win a war, all they got to do is stop shipping epinephrine. No EpiPens, no cardiac treatments, so we're done because we don't get, we don't, we don't make it here in the U.S. because the manufacturers told us it's too expensive to do it here because you have unions and, and we got to pay these people a living wage and in China, we don't have to pay them a living wage. We'll work them 24 <laughs> hours seven days a week and we can afford to produce epinephrine at a cost less than what we can sell it for otherwise we wouldn't make it at all so take your pick either don't have any or let's make it in china it's a huge issue uh we talked about the vehicles just an inside fun skinny on the vehicle thing uh it was a year ago two years ago the triple a naemt and ifc were on a call with the department of transportation over the vehicle crisis, ambulances, fire trucks, you name it. And they told us it's a chip issue, it, you know, all sorts of these things. So after the meeting, I emailed a good friend of mine, Rob Lawrence, who has a lot of contacts over in, in England because he's from the UK. I said, hey, Rob, can you find out if they're having these issues in the UK? So Rob sends a note to one of his fleet management buddies and says, hey, How's the ambulance shortage going over there? 
And the guy emails him back and says, I don't know what you're talking about. And Rob said, well, if you ask for an ambulance today, how long does it take you to get it delivered? And the guy was, and he showed me the email string, I, like for 30 days. He had an ambulance in 30 days. And it's a it's a Mercedes mini mod, you know, blah, 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 type three. And we're scratching our heads. So we go back to DOT and say, listen, this is not a chip issue. Because if it were a chip issue, the Mercedes trucks over in London, they wouldn't be able to get them either. So what's the real reason? Um, and they couldn't come up with an answer. So we said, all right, so here's the deal. We'd like permission to float a cargo ship over to London, where we are going to load up a thousand Mercedes mini mods, ship them back over to the US, en route, we're going to have the steering wheels moved and put on the right side of the truck and whatnot. But um, and you guys need to approve these trucks because there's no way we just can't, we're running trucks into the ground. We've got mission failures. And I said, Nope, can't do it. Doesn't meet our standard. And, and we're just like scratching our heads. So, so we, some of these things we just can't literally figure out it just makes you crazy. Reimbursement. Notice we put it into quotes here. This is our data for the last four years um, by payer. So notice that Medicare been pretty consistent. Medicaid's been pretty consistent, but continue, consistently sucky. But look at insurance. So, you know, we look at, at what insurance and facility payments and certainly what the patients are paying, this kind of sucks. And we see that reflected in our net collections per service provided. Um, now, part of this, a small part of it, is timing, right? So this is 2023 data. I pulled it last month. So this data is only May, June, July, August five or six months old, so that might still be going through the revenue cycle. But basically the, the reimbursements sort of suck. And remember I told you earlier today that for the first time in a decade, 12 years, technically, uh, MedStar is having to ask for a subsidy if the community wants to maintain the same ridiculous response time standards that they're getting uh, for low acuity calls. This is why. <clears throat> so you'll notice 14, 15, Revenue per patient contact, expense per patient contact. We do it that way because of all the MIH programs that we do that don't involve transport. Um, and in 2020, the lines crossed. So for 2021, 2022, we were a reserve spending. 2023, we're reserve spending. There's a limit to reserve spending because sooner or later, the checks bounce. <laughs> we just can't do that. Um, and systems across the country are facing the same challenge. I showed you the Knox County thing. Um, but this is, this is part of that whole dumpster fire. Um, insurance companies have just become ridiculous with essentially balanced billing. They are picking what they're going to reimburse and pushing for no balanced billing so they don't piss off their members. And that's why we have the Ground Ambulance Patient Billing Advisory Committee, GAP back for short. Um, several of us, and Scott, who I see on the panel here, um, have been participating in these meetings. We've got some really good industry representation on this committee, um, but they're working hard to figure out what does balanced billing for ground ambulance look like? Primarily, what does patient protection against balanced billing, meaning either we agree to not balance bill or the insurance companies agree to pay a reasonable rate? That's really what it comes down to. Then just to put more kerosene on the fire, the VA announced a year, less than a year ago, I think by accident, it's a whole other story, that they're going to reduce reimbursements from bill charges. So forever, for emergency calls, the VA has paid bill charges for providers. They said, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to pay the Medicare rate. It started that they were going to do that for non-emergency interfacility, for non-contracted ambulance agencies. When that first came out a year ago, we looked at it and said, you know, we don't do a whole lot of non-emergency. Um, the, the net impact to us was $400,000 a year. Not great, but, you know, not a huge deal. During one of the industry days where the VA hosted a town hall for the ambulance industry, they announced, no, 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 this isn't just for interfacility. This is for 911. That got everybody's attention. Because suddenly you go from you know, 100,000 transports nationally a year to millions of 911 calls for veterans and everybody just freaked out. 
and said, wait a minute, hold it. You didn't follow your rules. You can't make that announcement because if it was just non-emergency in our facility, then you followed your process. If you're going to impact 17,000 providers across the country, millions of veterans, you, you didn't follow your process to do that sort of a global change. Um, and that started a whole bunch of dialogue to the extent that several uh, representatives and senators said, wait a minute, to the VA secretary, you're going to do what now? You can't really do that. And places like Montana and Wyoming and these rural areas that really rely on both air and ground uh, services, it, it becomes an access issue. So they've pitched a fit. The industry has pitched a fit. Um, I can share with you that not necessarily trusting Congress to pass legislation, which was introduced, um, that prevents the VA from implementing this rule, by the way, on February 16th, I believe, 2024, we didn't have a lot of time. And as we know, Congress is running like a top right now. Um, legislation is just being handled very well and it's got good leadership. We didn't trust yeah. this legislation would make it through. So in a strategic move, working with several national partners and a very well-respected national law firm that specializes in suing the government, last night at five o'clock, MedStar and a handful of smaller agencies filed suit in circuit court, federal court, um, asking for a stay, court action, to stop this process until, and there's a list of like 28 different things that the VA did that they weren't supposed to do, they can't do, um, until those things are addressed, they can't do it. The VA, knowing that that suit was pending or that legal action was pending and getting all sorts of pushback from veteran service organizations, from the industry, started to blink, say, well, you know, maybe we don't need to implement it just yet, but we didn't trust them to do the right thing either. So we said, no, we're going to push it. I can share with you, at least on the bright side, yesterday, the tester bill that prevents the VA from implementing this rule was passed to be amended to required legislation by a voice vote in the Senate. They didn't even take a roll call. They just said, all in favor, aye. They added the, the amendment to the required VA funding bill. So in essence, if this makes it through, we get at least another year until September of 2024 to figure this out. Our and others' legal filing postpones it indefinitely until they can address all of the things that they violated in putting this rule into effect. So um, we'll see what happens. I, I literally, right before this call, this meeting, had an interview with a, the health reporter from Politico. Politico picked up on it because it was sort of leaked um, to the media that that we and others have filed this lawsuit uh, or injunction, I guess, technically. Um, so it's going to get some good public press. So we'll see. All right. Despite all the doom and gloom, what are the good things? All right. So the good things about what's happening is, again, as we said this morning, systems redesigning. And I won't belabor that point because we talked a lot about it this morning, but it gives us permission to do things that normally we couldn't have. It's also gotten the attention of regulators. So some states, some counties, some cities, recognizing the challenges, have agreed to start funding EMS at a level that they need to be funded. We've seen a couple of states in the past year and a half, two years, pass essential service designation. Good news, bad news. Good news, it's, it's essential service designation. Bad news is there, in many cases, there's not a clear path to funding. So it still requires a, a vote to have people vote to tax themselves in order to fund EMS. Um, so again, sort of good news, bad news. So we are seeing that happen across the country. The other thing that's happening is states are finally recognizing that the Medicaid reimbursement sucks and they need to do a better job of reimbursing EMS uh, on the Medicaid basis uh, for the services that they're providing. Here's an example of some of those bills. So this was Maine. Maine uh, basically did um, Medicare parity, and that's where you're seeing most of this. So Maine raised their Medicaid rates to the Medicare rates. Michigan did the same thing. New York just did the same thing, uh, including some direct pay legislation, which is really good. Um, balanced billing legislation. 
So there's been a plethora of states, most recently in the last month or so, Texas, Col uh, Texas, California, and Louisiana all passed patient protection legislation about balanced billing. We were exceptionally pleased with the Texas version because basically what the Texas version says is for the health plans that are licensed and regulated by the state of Texas, which is about 20% of the market here in Texas, if a local jurisdiction, Fort Worth, Arlington, Timbuktu, Texas, whatever, submits their rates to the state's clearinghouse, so they're setting that up now. So the city of Fort Worth says, hey, here's our ambulance rate. City of Dallas says, here's our ambulance rate. City of Laredo says, here's our ambulance rates. The, the payer, the third-party payer, must pay billed charges, period. If that jurisdiction or if a jurisdiction does not submit their rates for publication on the state's website, then the insurer must pay 325% of the current Medicare allowable for that locality. In return for that, we, the EMS industry, agree not to balance bill. And we said, hey, we're good, because if we're getting 325 or, or 350, 325 or bill charges, then we don't need to balance bill. Here was the behind the curtain conversation with the Texas Association of Health Plans. They told us, our lobbyists technically, that EMS, ambulance services in general, represents 0.19% of their spend. 0.19% of their spend. But we represent 98% of their public relations nightmare. <laughs> because every time some investigative reporter finds a single mom, a little old lady, whatever, they schlep them out in front of the, the cameras and they talk about how mean United Healthcare was and Blue Cross Blue Shield. And you know, it is not the local EMS agency is just trying to keep the lights on and reduce reliance on tax revenue and you know, the big, bad, you know, multi-million dollar profit insurance company is paying less than the cost. I said, we're happy to go to 0.2% of our spend just to stay off the six o'clock news. So just pass this already. So we sent this legislation, the Louisiana legislation and the California legislation, all of which is almost identical to the National Council of State Legislatures, but more importantly, to the Get Back Committee, to say, hey, you asked for samples of, of model legislation to take the patient out of the middle when it comes to surprise payments. This is the language. Just photocopy this, put it into the CFR, and we're good. Um, and there hasn't been a whole lot of pushback, by the way. So who knows? Maybe two years from now, um, that could actually be the deal. Um, revenue for new services. Hey, We've had uh, some... Uh, uh, Jim? Hang on. Jim? Jim, quick question. When you refer that the insurance has to pay the bill charges, what does pay the bill charges really mean? Is that first dollar coverage? Or are we just kind of re-identifying what balanced billing is as opposed to billing deductibles and co-insurance? Or no. for so deductibles and coinsurance were taken off the table. Um, if we do a Blue Cross Blue Shield patient and it's one of the plans not covered by ERISA um, and we send Blue Cross Blue Shield a bill for $1,900, Blue Cross Blue Shield pays $1,900. No deduction. Dollar. Deducted. Congratulations. That's first dollar coverage. Thank you. Yeah, because we didn't want to get into the whole high deductible health plan shit. You know, I mean, if you've got a $10,000 deductible because you chose it, now we're billing the patient. They're not out of the middle anymore. And again, the, the THP said it's 0.19% of our spend. Who cares? Move on. Um, I think, and, and Scott may have been listening or others, um, during one of the early gap back committee meetings, somebody, it may have been Asbel or maybe the consumer rep, I can't remember, uh, when AHEP, the American Health Insurance Plan representative, was talking about, well, you know, if we have to pay higher fees, the, the premiums will go up. And somebody said, uh, bullshit on that. 
what what percent of your spend your members spend is spent on ambulance service and i think at the time they had to go back and later in the day they said it's 0.14 percent so, so the consumer representative said so if it goes to 0.15 percent does that mean we're going to get premium increases come on it's just you know it's unbelievable back to the myth versus reality um, so we're seeing a bunch of payers getting more savvy now to pay for mobile integrated health care. So this is an agreement that we have with a large uh, managed Medicaid provider. They're paying us 150 bucks to manage their high utilizers, $150 per visit. So they send us a ton of people. Remember I said earlier today that we're going to see 55 patients today in our MIH program. Every one of them is paid for. Um, this represents about a third of our patient contact volume each day. Well, a quarter maybe. Um, but it's working really well. And there are a number of other payers that are finally doing this. They're recognizing the value. ET3, as we know, has been terminated, suspended, not suspended, stopped. Um, and I think most people understand the reason why CMS, CMMI finally admitted that they spent $10 million in, in contracted oversight and personnel in, to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of the ET3 model. And in the first two years of the model, they had 3,300 claims. So based on that run rate, there's no way that even if they had no expense, you know, no, if it saved 100%, that they would have a long road to, to save $10 million um, based on, you know, 100 claims a month coming into the model. And we get that. Shame on them for investing $10 million in oversight and evaluation. Shame on us for only having 44 agencies participating in ET3. And of those 44, only 10 submitted more than 12, or I'm oh, sorry, only 12 submitted more than 10 claims. And shame on us. We just did a poor job um, tr trying to get people up, up to speed on this. Yes, CMS made a bunch of requirements. Anyway, the reality is that many other payers are recognizing this as valuable and they're paying it anyway. And you'll see some examples of that in a second. And AAA, NAEMT, IFF, and ISC are pushing really hard to get statute into law through Congress that makes non-transport covered benefit. No bullshit, no requirement, no QHP, no telemedicine. If you respond, don't transport, you get paid. Just like a cardiac arrest that you feel terminate. Um, and there's been a plethora of activity just in the last two weeks, three, um, and this might actually happen. So we've got some really good legislation that's been sponsored um, and it's working well. Um, I won't go into the details, but patients that we put through the ET3 model, we submitted 12 <coughs> claims. Um, patients love it, saved a bunch of money, uh, $570 on average per ET3 member that was enrolled, uh, net savings to Medicare. So that's a pretty big number. Uh, we did manage to convince many other payers in our state and including state Medicaid. So our state Medicaid program pays for non-transport. No telemedicine requirement, no consent requirement, just protocolize it. And we've enrolled twice as many Medicaid patients into the non-transport program in only a year than we have in the ET3 model because it's protocolized, we just do it. Um, this was fun. So this is one of our managed Medicare payers. So they're paying us for the non-transport. We have several of these. This is the one that excites me the most. So our third largest commercial payer started a year or two years ago paying us for non-transport. I won't go into the details, but they're paying us the exact same, as you'll note there, for transport or non-transport. So for their membership, if we don't transport, they pay us $1,127. They love the model. It's saving them buku dollars. Their members are very happy. They wanted to go to the next level. So here's the next level, and you're going to love this. So we recommended, hey, we should get reimbursed for not sending anyone, but being able to mitigate your members' concern through the 911 center. Nurse triage, paramedic triage, um, telemedicine, whatever it is. If we get a 911 call, your member, we mitigate it in the 911 center. Don't send anybody. We'd like to get reimbursed for that. Or we can still send an ambulance. 
and you're going to pay us eleven hundred dollars for sending an ambulance and doing the same thing we could have done on the phone. Better for us, better for you if we just did it in the dispatch center. And how about like sixty bucks for that? Because we haven't sent anybody. It doesn't really cost us anything, but we want to get reimbursed. And they said, okay, what code would we use? Because it's not a Hixpix code, right? You can't use AO429. You can't use AO428. Um, so we found and they found codes that sort of sound like telemedicine. So if we take a patient from this insurer, which is about 20 patients a day, and we navigate them from the number one center, we can bill that code and we'll get reimbursed for dispatch services. But let's not stop there. How about this code? How about if we send a fly car only? So remember we said earlier this morning, there are calls that have a low transport rate. Why are we sending a $350 an hour ambulance to a patient that has a very low transport rate? Why don't we just send a $100 an hour fly car with an EMT to do an assessment? So they said, oh, I don't know, we, you know, what's the code for that? So we picked this one, which we've been using in other programs for mobile healthcare visits. And they said, yeah, that code works. So send us that code. If you send a fly car only with a single provider, it's not an ambulance, um, we're, we'll pay 175. Okay, cost us a hundred bucks an hour. We're, we're good. That's a pretty good reimbursement. Um, but what about for mobile healthcare services? So now we've got a commercial payer who's paying us to manage their high utilizers. So they pick the high utilizers, send them over, and we bill fee for service every time we see one of those patients to try and prevent an ER visit, we get paid. Works well, they love it. This is one that I'm pretty excited about. So like most communities, we have a tax supported hospital district. That tax supported hospital district, John Peter Smith Health Network, has never, ever, never, ever paid for emergency ambulance service to the ER. They have a JPS connection program, which is basically an engine care program. They don't pay for ambulance service unless it's from the hospital to somewhere else. Not in one service they don't pay for. Uh, we're in a little bit of a financial pickle. So we're trying to be innovative to figure out some ways to get more revenue for the services that we're providing. And the JPS connections patients represents about 10% of our call volume. So we have a great relationship with JPS. We made this following proposal. Hey, we can navigate your connections patients. And can you just tell us how much it costs to see them in the ER? And if we avoid the ER visit, maybe we do a shared savings where you pay us half the cost savings for the patient not going to the ER. And they said, hmm, sounds interesting because we're saving money. We're reimbursing half of our savings back to you guys. Okay, let's run with that. So, so here was their um, analysis that was done by them for their CFO and, and C-suite team. So it cost them $543 for a JPS connections patient to go to the ER or to be seen in the ER. That eerily is pretty close to the Medicaid rate, but that's a whole other discussion. The JPS connections patients, the indigent care patients, as you can probably imagine, have a very high utilization rate of the emergency department. Look at the bolded text. 94.5% of the connections members who show up in the ER don't get admitted. So they're using the ER as a clinic. Well, let's make it easier for them. Have them use the 911 system for their clinic because we'll navigate them, treat them on scene, get them to the health center, you know, whatever, um, and just keep them out of the emergency room. So they're going to give us a list every month of the JPS connections patients, demos, name, address, date of birth, cell phone number. That populates into our 911 call taking system. When those patients call 911, and they will, um, we have a special response plan built into the CAD for them, and we send a community paramedic along with the ambulance, and we do patient navigation. And for every patient that we don't bring to the ER, JPS will reimburse us $275. Be the first time in the history of JPS that they're paying for ambulance service, but they're only going to pay for it if we save the money. Think about that. In your communities, in Colorado or other places where you've got a public hospital district, it costs them money to see a patient in the ER. Why don't they reimburse you if you don't bring them there? Everybody wins. Patient wins, you win, you stay whole, and they keep patients out of the ER. Makes a ton of sense. We also started doing this a couple of years ago. I think I talked about this last year. Um, this program is, is working really, 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 really well. Um, high enrollment, low utilization. 
It's a concierge medicine program. Family sign up for 350 bucks a year, 24 seven access to a community paramedic um, and navigation. Uh, if they call 911 because we get all their medical records and we put them into our CAD so we know them, we know what their medical history is so we can safely do that. Bottom line for all of this is part of the transformation. Know your value proposition and your value proposition is totally driven by the perception of the check signer. Once you figure that out and can figure out how to talk to those people about the value that you can bring that has nothing to do with schlepping somebody to the emergency room, that's when you will become more than just an Uber ambulance um, being used solely for transportation. So last two signs. To the thief who stole my glasses, I will find you. I have contacts. <laughs> Man injured in bizarre peekaboo accident. He's in ICU. I know it's cheesy. Did I leave any time for questions? Like two minutes, right, Kim? No, you're good. You're good. Other questions for Matt in the room? Hey, Matt. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> so where's the QR code, right? So what you're going to do. <laughs> There's the QR code for this presentation. Um, and, and thank you to the, I thought there were only about 30 people on the thing total, and I've gotten 50 requests for the last presentation. <laughs> so people might be sharing the QR code, that's fine, whatever, but uh, kind of like when you go to a, a, a bus crash in downtown Fort Worth and the caller says, yeah, there are five people on the bus. The crew gets on the scene and says, we have 24 green because everybody got on the bus after the crash so they could have neck pain. So Matt, bus how can we get your legislation language for the surprise payment passports to see if we can get that change for the ERISA plans. Um, would you like me to send you the, well, you have something like that, Tim, don't you? Isn't it, you guys are like at 325 or 275 of Medicare as a requirement? Um, no, it's more convoluted than that. Um, but um, I mean, ultimately your solution in Texas, I think is the solution for Colorado. And it's the solution nationally, because my guess is with the state of Texas, as big as it is, with the population you have, with the utilization you have, and it's, what did you say, one point, less than one? Point one nine percent of their spend. Of their spending. How come, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer to be taking that language to the surprise billing, surprise payment, as you refer to it. I mean, if we could include that language along with some of the other stuff that you're working on, even if we could get 50% of the savings for MIH or for treatment in place, that's huge. It, it, it doesn't seem like rocket science. Tim, you're spot on. I'll send you the language from California, Louisiana, Texas that are all basically the same. Hold them up to a light and they all look pretty similar, uh, which are bill charges for public filing. Um, and by the way, it, it's provider agnostic. So whether you're AMR, GMR, Jim Joe Bob's Ambulance Service or um, Dallas Fire, it, it applies. The balance billing covers everybody. Um, the adversity breeds innovation. So we hadn't really thought about the indigent care fund savings until we were nervous about going to the member cities asking for a subsidy. And we knew that they were going to ask, are you doing everything possible to balance the books? Um, so the thought of a shared savings model for you know, the hospital system seemed logical. Uh, we did it with commercial payers. Why not do it with the hospital? We just had to make the pitch. And the thing that was sort of interesting was their, them coming up with the cost. That was something they had never done before. So they actually signed an administrative intern, somebody who's um, getting their MPH and all sorts of stuff, or MHA, MHA, um, Aubrey. And, and she worked on it. And she said, this was a pain in the ass because she had to get, you know, what's typically billed, what's typically reimbursed, what's the per hour cost to have a doc, a nurse, labs, you know, whatever, and was able to get the CFO's department in agreement that it's $543 cost 
to see a JPS connections patients in the ER. Okay, it's a good number. That's something we can work with. Yeah, we have a question on, online from actually from Texas, believe it or not. Uh, what comments can you make about concerns for not transporting patients or taking them to alternate destinations that have not been medically cleared? Were there problems with getting professional liability insurance? Did your cost increase for that coverage? And if so, by how much? So no, um, let me back up. So first part of your question, you have to have protocols. So your medical director, if you're the provider, your medical director has to set the protocol for who's eligible clinically for alternate disposition, treatment in place, transport to alternate destination. So if there's a clinical informed decision. So if you respond to a call, there is a medical evaluation. So the fact that there's no medical evaluation, I would argue is not true because you've got an EMT, a paramedic, who's doing an assessment that this patient is not going to die today from the reason that you were called for the 911 call. Um, and they meet clinical guidelines as determined by your medical director. Now, in our system, we use telemedicine as the backup. So everybody carries their little eligibility card for the ET3, for the alternate disposition model, and the patient meets those criteria. Um, then we do a quick telemedicine visit with either a doc or a behavioral health specialist who does the additional screening. Yep, patient will be fine. Have them call the doctor and blah, 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 and no issues. Um, it's been perfectly fine, but we only do it for payers who pay us for that service. If the payer is not eligible, if they're if they're not agreeing to pay us for the non-transport, then we don't do it for their patients. Uh, we take them to the ER because that's what they're going to reimburse us for. They're not going to reimburse us for the treatment in place, so we don't offer it to them, uh, to their patients. And then what was the second? Oh, um, we had no increase in liability costs. We talked with the Texas Municipal League, who does our insurance, and they said. This is actually safer than taking someone to the hospital by ambulance. We're good. Just move on. Thank you. Other questions? Tim has another for you. Matt, I just want to be clear on your bill. <coughs> on bill charges. Insurance has to pay bill charges. And your comment was if, if and I'll change it a little bit, if we send a bill to Blue Cross and it's a state administered plan of $1,900, they have to pay $1,900. Let, let me look it up just to make sure. Stand by. Standing by. <clears throat> Proposed rule, because now they're in the rulemaking process, signed into law, clean. Let me look at the actual legislation. Sorry to be zooming out of the camera. I'm trying to read. <laughs> oh, and they have to automatically increase the Medicare allowable by 10% every year. That 325. Um, yeah, from Colorado, it might add. <laughs> yeah, I'll send it to you. It doesn't, it, it, there's no deduction for deductible or coinsurance. So that is, if we if we're using the same understanding of what first dollar coverage is, you successfully got first dollar coverage in Texas using that language in your bill. Right. Why can't we do that in Colorado? Why can't we just photocopy that language? <clears throat> that's amazing yeah, I'll, I'll send you the bill um, the, the past perfect and one more thing if you
go back to your PCG slide that kind of talked about Firebase EMS and EMS and based fire service EMS EMS based fire. Yes, EMS based fire. And when you were comparing the cost between them, so that's that's huge. And even some of us in the room were discussing, does that EMS only service providers? Does that include your third service providers as well in Texas? Because my our costs are higher than $1,026.32. So you have to be a public agency. And Kim, let the record show that I was done. It's Tim's fault that we're running overtime. Um, That's always the case. <laughs> we're good. Never let it said that I'm not transparent, right? <laughs> it's got to be somebody's fault, believe me. So here are all the participating agencies in the RGEMT program. Okay, so you have to be a public not showing, not showing anything right now, just so you know. Oh, um, here we go. There you go. Is that better? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. So, here are these are all public providers, right? So, fire departments, hospital districts, you know, blah blah blah. Um, and this was what they got reimbursed for their costs. So you can see there are some that are pretty low, but this is probably because it's based on volume, right? So, because it, it's it's a reimbursement per Medicaid transport. Um, so Austin and, and MedStar here, we're non-fire based. Um, this is Montgomery County Hospital District, their hospital district, but they're a public provider. So yeah, costs are dramatically different. We have another question, James. Hey, Maddox, it's James Tiny. Uh, good to see you, brother. A um, couple of quick questions, they're all kind of together. Uh, the first one is on the, the agreements that you have with the private payers, um, did you have to sign in network agreements with them and become an in network provider uh, to receive those reimbursements on your mobile integrated healthcare services? Um, do you know of anybody or are there any agreements that you're doing with any of these insurance companies where you are not in network with them and they're still doing that? And then the third question is, um, do you have any interest in coming out and working with the consortium here in Colorado to work with our private insurance providers um, to uh, put together similar agreements? Yes, yes, and absolutely. <laughs> no. Um, so number one, all of the commercial payers and even the managed Medicare, managed Medicaid payers that we are um, doing the APM with, we are in network for because they require that to do some shared data collection because that facilitates them sending us data on their members that even we're not going to touch yet and all that sort of stuff, um, but also allowed us to modify the payment schedule with, for example, CPT coding instead of just HixPix coding and that kind of thing. Um, but what I can tell you is that the rates that they're paying us for the in-network services are the same that they would have paid us if we were out of network. So we didn't negotiate ambulance rates with them. We said these, these, these are the rates paying. James brought up a good question. Does one supersede the other? So if you're an in-network provider and they have different <coughs> rates for paying ambulance, how does that impact your legislative rate? You get less. Do you have to accept the in-network rate? So currently that is true. So guess what we're doing on renewal of these agreements? Increasing them to the rate. <laughs> and, and to be fair, the, the conversations with the managed Medicare, managed Medicaid, and the commercial payers that we've had, they, they've said, you know, the, the payment for the ambulance is budget dust for us. It's it's the ER visits for these high utilizers that are killing us. So if you can help us with those, uh, we'll pay the ambulance for you, don't care. 
Thank you, Matt. Any other questions here in the room? Connie's holding you away from dinner. Because now Tim's going to blame him. I can see it. <laughs> any questions online? I don't see any hands raised or any additional comments. Matt, thank you so much. As always, I will be reaching out to you to get the uh, uh, presentation, but I'll do it the old fashioned way and not through the QR code. Uh, they've already seen my ability to operate a computer, so they know I'm going to have no luck with the phone. Anyway, thank you, Matt and Scott Moore. We will be back to visit with you in about.